All right. How about now? Can you see it now? I can see it. All right. No technical difficulties this time. Sounds good. All right, guys. So someone else can see it, right? Yeah. Maybe the problem is on my side. Then. Yeah. OK. Can you uh, try turning it off and back on? <laughs> the very classic IT techniques. Give me 10 seconds or something. <laughs> All right. So awesome. All right. So guys, uh, thank you guys for coming today. Um, this is the first time I've given this like the business version of this. Usually I talk about like the math and computer science stuff behind this. So um, today I'm going to talk to you about big data techniques. My name is Yuzhen Tang. Uh, I was a software engineer at Amazon. I have a paper published in IEEE Big Data on data fusion. Um, and I'm basically a computer science nerd. So uh, what is the data analysis process? Um, you know, we start with cleaning the data, which is really important if you have dirty data and you run your models on it, you're going to get screwed no matter what. So cleaning data is super important. Uh, and then you want to analyze the data, which includes the actual data analysis part, and then interpreting what the data analysis tells you, and then a way to visualize the data. And then you want to apply what you've learned from your data analysis. And that's the whole data analysis process. That's the whole data analysis pipeline. Um, so let me motivate why we would do data analysis in the first place. Like, you know, you're a, you're you're a business owner and you have like three gigabytes of data. You're like, what the heck do I do with this? You know, what am I going to do with this? Well, why do why do we, why do we analyze the data? Um, so we want to start with understanding the data. We want to understand what is our data telling us, um, and then we want to use that understanding to predict trends and update assumptions. Uh, so basically. Data analysis will help you figure out a like how your company is doing and like be, allow you to do projections, and then update your assumptions on certain things. So perhaps you are uh, running an e-commerce store online and you're selling clothes, and your assumptions are you know red clothes sell really well in the first three months. Then you do your data analysis and you're like, oh, it turns out red clothes actually sell really well in you know the second quarter. Um, so then you know you update your assumptions that way. So let's start with data cleaning. Uh, I'm going to talk about some data cleaning techniques. Um, so the first, the most easy kind of data cleaning technique is like key points or expected values. Uh, this is usually something that if you control the way the data is collected, this is one of the easiest data cleaning techniques. So if you're taking a survey and you're getting um, uh, like, you only want to learn about people who, uh, let's say, have got the COVID vaccine. And in your survey, one of your questions would be, have you had the COVID vaccine? And if their answer is no, then that means they're not fitting your expected value, the answer that you expected from them. And you can throw that entire data set out. You can just throw out the entire survey. You don't need to look at that data. So this reduces a lot of the work that we have to do. And this tells us when we're looking at dirty data that we don't care about. Uh, and then the next thing you want to do is you want to prune outliers. And so here on the, uh, it's the right, yeah, here on the lower right, uh, I have an example of uh, age to, num uh, to the number of respondents. And here you can see, you know, if someone says their age is 356, this is a clear outlier. I have no idea who in the world is 356 years old. So you can completely get rid of their data. Uh, and then the last one is data fusion, which is a much more um, advanced data cleaning technique. Um, this is actually what I wrote my paper on um, when I was doing research. And data fusion is essentially when you say, OK, so my data set tells me that this is uh, the right uh, number. And this is the data that we collected. Um, let's take data from other sources and see what they tell us about what the data should be. Uh, so I'll give you an example from what I did um, when I was doing research, which was one of the things that we were measuring was particulate matter in the air that was uh, less than 2.5 micrometers. Uh, and so there's a bunch of different things that affects that, um, one of them being humidity. Uh, temperature, um, air pressure, particulate matter under one uh, under one micrometer. Um, so there's a lot of different types of data that'll affect that. And uh, data fusion basically says that let's take all of these other data, let's take the information from them. So like let's take temperature, air pressure, humidity. Let's take that data and tell us what and figure out what that tells us about um, this particular matter of 2.5 micrometers. 
now let's get into data analysis techniques. Um, so there's three main data. There's, there's, there, you can actually split this up in more categories, but I just wanted to put it into three categories to make it more easily digestible. So there's clustering, which is essentially when you look at a bunch of data and you cluster the data. Um, you know, you just look at the data and you're like, all right, these data, these data, these data points go together. Uh, then there's regression, which is where you're doing uh, some sort of trend prediction or some sort of classification. Um, and then there's correlation, which is when you look at either how two different data sets are correlated or the multiple variables in your data set are correlated with each other. So now I'm going to give some examples of clustering, regression, and correlation. So here's our uh, here's a set of three clustering techniques. Um, you may have seen these before. You may not have seen these before. Uh, here in the uh, left, we have um, a clustering technique called k-means. So k-means, what essentially this is saying is this is saying we have k number of means in the data, and let's cluster the data so that we can find where these means are. Um, and in this case, this particular case, we're showing three different means. And a practical application of this would be like we have three different uh, types or different classes that we're looking at. So perhaps you are um, selling, uh, I don't know, jewelry. And the three classes of jewelry that you want to look at are earrings, uh, rings, and necklaces. And then you would have three different means. And you would take your data, you would throw all of your data onto a map, and then you would run this algorithm, uh, which if you want to, we can get into how you can run that. Um, but you run the algorithm, and it shows you, OK, this is how all of these data are clustered. And then we here have here on the upper right, this is uh, k nearest neighbors, which is essentially classifying a point with um, k to its k nearest neighbors. Uh, and this requires an already classified data set, and you're just adding a new point and classifying that new point. As you can see from our example, we have the uh, squares here and the triangles here as our pre-classified uh, pre, pre data. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to classify this green circle. We're looking at this green circle, and we're like, all right, what, what, is, this, is this green circle supposed to be a triangle? Is it supposed to be a square? And in this example, what I actually want to show is that depending on what you pick for k, you will have a different classification for the green circle. So if you pick three, then you have the three nearest neighbors, which are these three, and you would classify the circle as a triangle. But if you pick five, then you would have three blue squares and two red triangles, and you would classify it as a blue square. And then if you go out, you would just have, you know, at the more, the more, the bigger k is, the 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 more data points you have to take into consideration to classify this. One of the reasons why we would use something like this is because it's super, super quick classification. If you already know what classes your data is in and you just throw another like data point on there, um, all you have to do is find the x nearest points, super quick classification. And then in the bottom here, we have um, what is this called? Support vector machines. And this is actually, uh, I particularly chose an example where you have to use a hyperplane. Um, so otherwise, support vector machines kind of look like uh, linear regression where you draw the line and then it splits the plane into two. I'll, I'll show you the picture for that in the next slide. And it splits the plane into two different um, two different categories. But in this case, this image here, this like image where you have these like red circles on the outside and the blue uh, pluses on the inside, this is clearly not a linearly separable um, data set. Like you look at this, you can't draw any line like this way, this way, this way. To, to separate this data. Um, so then you would run a support vector machine with what's called a kernel. And you would essentially project it onto a third dimension in order to classify these data. And it shows you here, if we project it onto a third dimension, we can draw a cone with this. And we can classify the data with a plane right here. Um, so this, this is SVMs, or support vector machines, are classically considered one of the best uh, classification methods because of this ability to do the kernel trick. And you can apply this. Um, you want to apply this on data sets that don't look simple, basically. Um, now we're going to talk about regression, which is the classification or prediction part of things. So here we have linear regression, which is essentially like, OK, my data set looks like it's in a line. So I'm going to guess that it's a line, and we draw this line. And so if this were a support vector machine, which is what this is, 
essentially we would draw this line and say, all the points above the line are class one, all the points below the line are class two, or vice versa. But um, in linear regression, what we're trying to do is we're trying to do trend prediction. So clearly not all of these points are on the line, but if we draw the line, and this, this is our data set, and we draw the line and we continue drawing it, we'll be able to kind of predict where the next points should land. Um, and then, so this is like something like, you know, you want to maybe you're like looking at your site and you think that it's growing linearly. That's generally not true for how website traffic grows, but uh, it could happen. And you want to do linear or linear regression and you can say, okay, in three months, I will have this many users. And then up here on the top, we have logistic regression, which, you know, takes a similar looking data set and it classifies it into a one or a zero. So basically what you do is you run a... Uh, gate function on this. You just run a function that classifies the data into a one or a zero. Um, and, the class of, and it classifies your data, basically. So this is kind of similar to what I was talking about with the support vector machines, where it draws a line and it says, OK, you know, on top, it's one. On top and the bottom, it's zero. But instead of drawing the line, it actually just moves the points. And then we have neural networks, which is everybody's favorite. This is like the biggest, most like fire topic in computer science is just like machine learning and AI. Um, and actually, you'll see you'll see like a uh, a chart later where I where I where it's like predicts like AI's like uh, market share, and um, this is basically the most popular thing in AI. This is what everybody's working on. Neural networks are they can be super super simple. They can be two nodes. They can be like just I'm sorry just like these two these this set of three, and you can call that a neural network. They usually call that a perceptron. Um, this is a four-layer neural network with two hidden layers, and this is like pretty complicated looking. So the way that neural networks work is essentially, you know, we get some data, and then we just pass it along, we multiply it and multiply it with a weight and add a certain bias. And you just pass it along until you get to the output layer where it says, okay, this is what I think your uh, classification is. Um, and then it updates by doing some like complex calculus things that I don't want to get into, and it updates all of your weights. Um, Neural networks are super, super useful. This is basically what you would use for anything that you wanted to do that was more complex than like a small data set. Like, so if you want to classify texts, neural networks. If you want to classify like images, you can pick out cats, you can pick out dogs, you can even pick out logos of companies. Um, pretty much like anything you want to do you would, that's complex, you would use a neural network. Um, finally, we get to correlation. And this is actually not a very good name for this slide. I just couldn't think of a better one. So, um, But these are all techniques that are, are along, along correlation. So I'm going to talk about this one up here in the upper right first. This is um, principal component analysis. Uh, and this is actually um, not the best example. And here we have two dimensions, and we're projecting it onto two more dimensions. But it's also very hard to get a good picture of a good example of PCA, because what you want is you want to have, like, 24 dimensions and project that onto two dimensions. But what PCA does is essentially it says, OK, let's look at all of the features that affect our, um, let's look at all of the features that affect our data set. And then let's find, the, and let's find a linear combination of the features that captures the most variety, but also reduces the number of dimensions or the number of features that we have to look at so that we have to do less calculations. So this is essentially something that you would do if you have like way too many features in your data set. So let's say, for example, like you're trying to do uh, COVID. Uh, you're trying to like classify COVID cases. And your features are like age, pre-existing health conditions, what they ate yesterday, uh, where they live, X, Y, Z, A, B, C, you know, so on. What you would want to do is you want to run PCA on that because then you take your, you know, 300 different variables that you can use to like classify people and you smush it down into like two or three. And hopefully what you, what you would really like to see is that you want to see that that two or three, those two or three variables account for 90% or more of the variation in the data. Um, and then here, um, this is uh, called uh, alternating least squares. Um, this is used for like recommend, recommendation systems. Uh, so like Netflix basically, uh, would use this, they would take your user ratings of movies and then user ratings of other users that have watched those movies as well as other movies, and they give you recommendations. So like, you know, if you've watched a bunch of Disney movies um, and then, you know, other people, you know, have also watched a bunch of Disney movies and there's one you haven't watched, like Frozen or something, 
and it sees that you've rated all of these Disney, Disney movies really highly. Um, I hope Frozen is a Disney movie, by the way. Um, and then it would recommend Frozen. It'd be like, look, you know, you rated all these movies highly. This other, these other, like, you know, 200 users, it wouldn't tell you about the other 200 users, but this is what it's doing in the background. These other 200 users also rated this movie really highly. So we're going to recommend it to you. And that's essentially what this does. Um, and then here we have, this is the most complex correlation um, technique. And also it's my favorite because I did a uh, project on this where I created the library for the SK Learn CCA. And basically what this is, is it takes two hyper high dimensional data sets. So like, you know, five dimensions or four dimensions or whatever. Um, and it basically projects them onto each other. Oh, five and five probably. And it projects them onto each other. So what this kind of like, this is, I, I couldn't actually find a very good visual for this, but essentially like if you try to imagine like two planes, two pieces of paper intersecting in, in real life, and then find the angle, this is what it does. Canonical co correlation analysis finds that angle and it projects one paper onto the other. Uses of this, one of the most prominent uses that I've seen is when you do image analysis. So one of the, one of the problems, one of the big problems with image analysis is that um, if you've seen any of the like news recently, it's like, oh, you know, we can recognize these faces, X, Y, Z, but it only works on like white people. It just doesn't work on black people. It doesn't work on Indians. It doesn't work on Asians that well. And one of the reasons for this is because they're not using this correlation analysis. And then so the skin color gets really a heavy uh, um, weight in the image analysis. And what this does is essentially this extracts out features of the face. So this extracts out eyes, nose, mouth, ears, hairline, things like that. Um, and this kind of, one of the great things about this is it just bypasses that like uh, data bias that you get from uh, your data, which, you know, the reason why all of these image analysis things are only able to recognize white, white men is because all of their data is trained on that. So this kind of allows you to skip out some of the bias and that's pretty cool. So now I'm gonna, get over the, all the math stuff. Hopefully that didn't bore you guys too much. And I'm going to talk about how to apply these to businesses. So these are just three ways to apply to business. There's tons and tons of ways. I just picked three. Um, so you can create customer profiles um, where essentially, you know, you look at your customer and you're like, this customer likes to buy red shirts in the winter time. This customer likes to, you know, leave things in their cart for seven days. This customer likes to um, ABC, XYZ, whatever. You can create customer profiles using your data sets where you say, like, okay, you know, this customer, you know, this, this type of person that does this is generally age 18 to 24, income XYZ, um, spends about 30 minutes on our site at a time. And then you can also predict market trends. Um, this is usually a little bit more difficult. And this requires more data set than just the data set that you may have for your business. So this might actually require you going out to go get more data or finding people who have more data. But market trends is essentially where you want to predict where the market is headed. Um, so let's say you know, you're a business owner and you see that um, Tamagotchis are getting really popular again. Uh, and, and you look at the last few years and you're like, man, they really took a dip in popularity for those first two years, like, you know, 2018, 2019, but 2020, you know, they, they really started to come back. And maybe you see like, you know, the months of 2020 was, you know, as COVID, as COVID started getting more lockdown, uh, lockdown intensive, people started getting more Tamagotchis and you're like, oh, you know, I'm going to cash in on this, this Tamagotchi trend real quick. Uh, and you hop in and you sell some Tamagotchis for a while. Um, or you can predict like trends into the future, like, the AI market thing, uh, which you'll see on the next slide. And the last thing you can do is product efficiency or optimization. Um, so this is basically where you want to say like, uh, so I have this product. Um, let's say that you sell, you know, custom laptops. Um, you want to be efficiently selling these to people to maximize your uh, to your to your profit or your revenue or whatever it is that you want to maximize. Um, maybe maybe it's like, I want to maximize this so that I have a good amount of time and also a good amount of money. You know, This is the efficiency optimization thing is really up to you. That's like what you find personally useful. But basically what this does is you can kind of look and you can say, okay, you know, uh, last month, 300 people bought at this price, uh, 200 people bought at this price, 100 people bought at this price. Then you can adjust your prices and you can adjust the number of people that you need to buy at that price to create your... Um, 
optimal pricing for your product and optimal features for your product and all of these things. Um, so here's some pictures of things that you can uh, do for the application stuff, because I'm a visual learner. I love pictures, um, so I assume other people do too. Um, so here we have an example of this is like kind of like creating your customer profiles. So let's say, you know, these green, this is one set of customers. This is one set of customers. You know, these two are the same. Uh, this is one set of customers. These two are, you know, th there's two different colors of orange, but like, you know, they're basically like one set of customers. Maybe they're just like two different demographics, but they all buy the same thing. Um, so you can create customer profiles and you can kind of link them like in terms of similarity and you can track them on things they like, you know, um, generally if you can kind of profile someone's like preferences and whatever, then you can kind of guess at the products that they'll buy. So, you know, if people really like chocolate, they really like sweet things, and it's a very high chance that pastries will sell well to them. You know, they'll love pastries too. Um, and this is what I was talking about earlier, where you can essentially use this data that you have to predict uh, market trends. And this is someone's prediction of artificial intelligence revenue in world markets. Um, Basically, they said, here's the 2016 data, here's the 2017 data, here's the 2018 data, here's the 2019 data, here's the, 20, here's the 2020 data, here's what we think it's going to be in 2021, 2022, 2023, 2024, 2025. And what you can essentially learn from this graph is that this graph looks like AI revenue is growing at an exponential rate. So if you trust the data in this graph and you trust um, Tractica, then you would jump in and say, hey, let me get in on the AI scene and let me get into the AI market. Um, and then this is essentially a rehashing, a, a more number picture, like a more concrete example of what um, recommender systems look like. This is called collaborative filtering, basically. You have a user matrix where the user rates A, B, C, D, and then you have an item matrix where these are like other ratings that for W, X, Y, Z, and then you've these are the low rank approximations of the matrix, and you just you know you have the user like you can fill in the, these little like blanks, so you can kind of like guess at what the user would rate, uh, you know, item one, item two, item three, stuff like that. Um, so that's basically all I have for you guys. Thank you for uh, the presentation. Here's just a review of what. I talked about today and what I hope you to take away from this presentation. So A, remember to clean your data. Dirty data um, is just going to screw you over, and you're not really going to be able to learn anything from it. And not only that, but your models are going to have uh, not very good accuracy rates. Number two, um, remember to use different data analysis techniques for different goals. We don't want to use uh, you know, k nearest neighbors to um, do a linear, to, to, to kind of like guess market trends. That's, that's not going to work. Uh, number three, this one I see a lot, mostly among like young data scientists, kind of like me. Um, correlation is not causation. You can find super high correlations with data, and it does not mean anything. You can find 0.999 correlations between two different sets of data, and it does not mean that one would cause the other. And a great example I have of this, um, this was when I was at UNC. There was like something where someone showed like how the correlation between uh, Duke winning the championships, like the NCAA championship, and like the crime rate in, um, oh, was it the Triangle area? And, and the crime rate somewhere, anyway. They basically correlated these, and they were like, this is a super high correlation. But it's clear that, like, like, that is like, there's no way you can say that Duke winning the, the championship is what caused you know, this increase in cr crime rate. That's ridiculous. Um, you can predict the future with data. Um, Kind of like this image shows here, the AI revenue, right? You can take the data that you have and you can predict what you think the future will look like. Of course, this means that you have to trust the data model. You have to trust your data. You have to trust how clean your data is. You have to trust the person or the group or whoever you hire to, or yourself, you know, if you, if you do the data analysis yourself, you have to trust that your analysis is correct. Um, and yeah, so with great power comes great responsibility. And that pretty much wraps it up. Does anyone have any questions? Yeah, go for it. What is the biggest challenge? Um, I personally think that the biggest challenge is going to be um, in the interpret in the interpretation of the data. Um, many you can get 
uh, I don't have a good example for this. Um, but like, you know, let's say that you look at your data and you see that maybe you've been adding new features to your application and you've seen the user rate go up. Uh, and maybe your interpretation is, oh my God, these features are getting new users. Um, and I would be very careful with making those kinds of jumps. Just because you see that happen uh, does not mean that your features are getting new users. It could be because of other things. Like maybe, um, maybe it just so happens that your advertising has gone really well recently and you just went viral on Instagram. That could be part of it, you know. Um, so you have to look at you have to look at a broad set of data in order to really draw very good conclusions. Um, so maybe maybe one of the biggest challenges is like being able to classify which sets of data that you need to look at. So um, yeah, so that's a that's a very good question. Um, so this is what I was talking about in data cleaning. Um, this is one of the most important parts, and this is definitely one of the biggest challenges too. Uh, you want to keep in mind what your end goal is. Um, so for example, if your end goal, if you're doing text analysis and your end goal is, I want to um, find all of the good and like the really good reviews of my product. What you would have to be careful about is you would have to train your data to recognize what is a really good review, not necessarily train your data to recognize, I mean, train your model, sorry. You have to train your model to recognize what is a really good review and not necessarily train your model to recognize the difference between good and bad reviews. So you have to keep in mind what exactly it is that you want your model to do when you um, are training it. And so that's like one thing for data, uh, for like data that you wanna use. Um, I really recommend data fusion as like a data cleaning technique because then you have like you know two or three different uh, quote unquote points of view to your data points, um, and that kind of helps you narrow out narrow down like which data is good, which data is bad, which data should I use um, X Y Z. Mm-hmm. Um, it depends on which user data you have. Like, I think like if you just, maybe if you have like websites, um, yeah. Yes, you would have to create a specific algorithm for the case. Um, you have to train a model specifically for a use case. Um, no, no, no. We we uh, Tech Founder Connect is like a. It's essentially like a tech consulting. Like I come in. What I do with Tech Founder Connect is I come in and I say, okay, what do you want to build? And then you tell me like, okay, I want to build, you know, X Y. So I'll give you an example. Um, so I just worked with this lady. She wants to. Or I, I just started talking to this lady um, that wants to work with us. Her name is like Mary Neth, and she wants to build this company called Vendwell, which essentially is like connecting local artisans with health conscious consumers that look for high quality local products through the use of a vending machine. And that's what she says she wants to build. So what I come in is I come in and say, okay, what is your like what 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 kind of technology do you need to make this happen? And then I say, okay, how do we get you on the path to create the minimum viable product that will make this happen? For example, for her, a minimum viable product does not necessarily have to be an application, doesn't necessarily have to be a vending machine. It could be something as simple as like a website where she gets local artisans and puts their products on it and then sets up a booth 
where people can order ahead and come and pick up their products. Essentially a person vending machine, right? An in-person vending machine. Um, or like I was working with uh, the people who want to collect artists and collectors. And what I'm doing for them is, you know, they really want this app. They really want their minimum viable product to be an app. They already, they already have the actual minimum viable product. Like they're, these people are both running galleries, which does that exact same thing. And so I come in and I say, okay, what do you want your app to do? And then I separate out like the features that are like viable to build within like, you know, one to three months and the features that are like, you know, nine to 12 months kind of. And I'm like, okay, this is, this is how you want to build this. This is your technical strategy, ABC. And then I like, once, so once they have, once like I've helped them do their technical strategy, once they've interviewed some customers, once they've gotten some partners, then I introduce them to developers that would be interested in, in developing the application. So the actual thing with data cleaning is actually, so Bormal, my initial company, my original company is what I use to do um, data analysis. What I'm doing for that is I'm predicting market trends. Yeah. No questions? I think everyone's muted still. Uh, I have a question. I apologize, sure. I don't have my headset on. Go so for you it. might get some feedback. Um, in regards to artificial intelligence, can you, as an example, I'm a marketer, can you take a data set of a certain environment, let's say uh, we can pull Brazil, right? Sure. Um, can we take that data set and actually use artificial intelligence to directly market an advertisement to a specific person? Yeah, that's, I mean, you mean like targeted ads? Yeah, so like, okay, like, this... like an example, I could generate, a you know, 100 different ads and let's say your AI can pick up uh, the data set of people in Brazil and that my ad will be more, you know, catered to their specifications, maybe a female with a certain language um, indicating to either buy this or download this or whatever the case is. Yeah, you can totally do that. All you need is um, the pre-existing data on people who have responded to those advertisements. Um, so let's say you have 100 ads and you kind of know which uh, demographic each one appeals to. Um, and then you have the demographic of the person that you want to appeal to. And then you just kind of, uh, you just run their information through the model. And the model would say, okay, send them this ad. This is kind of like, it's actually very similar to how, uh, this is basically exactly the same thing that Facebook and, and Twitter and Instagram use to show you your ads. You know, they're like, ah, yes, yeah. you know, this guy runs a business. Let me, let me, let me show them an advertisement about, I don't know, how to run a business or something. Like, for example, for me, like I get shoes advertisements all the time because it's like, they're like, oh, this guy likes fancy shoes. And so they give me these like weird, like shoes that are like, they have like really cool drawings on them and stuff. And I'm always like, ah. Oh, I should get some shoes, but I'm like, I already have like 10 pairs of shoes. So, right. But we can, we could definitely niche down on that, right? We could, we can add on top of their algorithm, our algorithm, and say, hey, you know, you're getting like, as you mentioned, shoes advertisement or whatever. You, we can be specifically creating ads with more women, you know, or, or whatever the case is, whatever you're mm -hmm. into, right? Yeah. And then directly target that. Um, yes. If you want to, I mean, yes, you could niche down on, um, Instagram and Facebook's like uh, like big social networks media's like advertisement a model for for like their targeted advertising model. Um, I hmm. well, let me know if that. you go that it route, seems... huh? Let me know if you want to go that route. <laughs> okay. Um, my my no my my thought on that is that uh, it's I'm not quite sure that the return on investment that you would get doing that would be worth it because it would be pretty expensive to 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 model that um you would need a lot of data i mean if you have the data it might not be that bad but training well, the model you might can be kind of you can provide it as a as a SaaS as a service right you can you can just provide as a service to marketers in general that are already creating ads specifically um by hand anyways um yes you you can. Um, it just really, your worry is the return of investment considering the cost for the application. If you can have a, a data sample already, um, you, you shouldn't, I mean, you could probably, you probably won't break even in the first six months to a year maybe, but 
after that, it shouldn't, it shouldn't be a problem because it's just a matter of increasing your, your sample size, right? Um, no, actually. So the thing about increasing sample sizes is that you have to make sure that the data that you're intaking matches the data sets that you're looking for. And increasing sample sizes definitely increases the cost in terms of money and time for training data sets. And my, my, my concern is actually not so much the return on investment for, let's say, the person that creates the application. My, my thing is, like, I don't even know if it's like worth running it because Twitter and Facebook and Instagram have such ridiculously, like, these guys know everything about you. Like, it's crazy. <laughs> like, I, I, I don't even know, like, what data you would have to get to, like, know more than, than these companies. Like, these guys really know everything. You know, like, you're on Facebook. If you have Facebook open on a tab, they know all the other tabs you have in the background. Right, right. It's not specifically the the initial. Okay, so in marketing, you have the top of the funnel, which is the initial push for uh, getting a product seen to the first initial viewer. Okay, sure. Um, it's not so much that that the funnel is a concern. It's more in the fact that okay, once you do the initial, let's say, ad spend for that first product view. In this case, as an example, you said a shoe. Um, huh. It could be where, you know, they're just trying to get a market reach. They're trying to get an, an assumption based on whatever they spend on how many people are actually enjoying that shoe or whatever that ad is. Uh, what I'm like, talking about is more regards to, okay, once we have that data set, how can we more specifically target that audience to, uh, to incentivize them to buy that shoe? So let's say, uh, okay, you know, we could like, I can, I can do a, a photo shoot with some nice shoes and that sure. might get somebody's attention like yours but what do we do yeah. next to get that to the next level so you're clicking buy now rather than you know just sitting on it and, and mulling it over that type of thing oh like in terms of, like the type of advertisement like what yeah kind of advertisement like the advertisement itself specifically designed so like it could be like a fashionista running in hollywood and she has a lamborghini or something there's and it happened to be like that shoe, you know what I mean? Like whatever, whatever, uh, it is. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> whatever okay. the whatever the algorithm says. Hey, you know this guy will probably buy it because there's a Lambo in the back, and there's a there's a nice nice looking girl, and she oh. wears those Skechers or something like that, right? How to combine like different parts of like someone's like interests into one ad? Is right. that what you're asking? Okay. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So definitely possible. Very very difficult. Putting images together. Very very difficult. Or at least having some type of like data set that would that would at least recommend or suggest something like that. So like in in my case, like if I was selling a product, right? Uh -huh. As you mentioned, the shoe. Um, and again, just going on the shoes, so we don't get off topic. Yeah, sure. If, if I wanted to buy a shoe and it's Supreme shoes or something like that, then specifically, yes, Facebook will know how to target Supreme shoes to me all day long, right? Based yeah, on yeah. my my algorithms and me looking at different Supreme products or whatever the case is. Yeah. Um, but I want to be specific in regards to actually showing that ad for more to the shoe itself and saying, okay, since since Facebook knows I like Lamborghinis and I like crypto and I like all these, whatever, whatever data sets, right? Um, it could suggest to the marketer to say, hey, look, these are some key indicators that this demographic, this population audience or whatever um, will most likely want to buy this product if you include these type of things. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So you could definitely do that. You would do that through a combination of uh, the creating customer profiles. And then okay. you would probably do that with some sort of canonical correlation analysis where you could actually just um, take like two different kinds of users and say these users both enjoy these. So, know, so another example, like, okay, so, so women are usually typically the spending power of America. That's typically how it is 80% or whatever. Um, any anybody who purchases that is you know married or whatever, it's typically the woman that does it. Okay, um, sure. so, so let's say, okay, we take a woman as example as a persona. Um, she most likely, and again, this is just me stereotyping, so I apologize if I'm wrong or whatever. But let's say she watches Bachelor, right? She's really into the Bachelor. Um, typically, <laughs> okay. the people who are really into the Bachelor have specific niches that they like, right? So more like romance or or certain clothes or certain brands that are affiliate to the bachelor um resonate across that industry right you you probably won't see like a bachelorette or a bachelor person be like hey crypto and my lambo and stuff like that right um but you'll see certain niches be in that demographic 
Um, I guess my thing is like, as a marketer, I'm already assessing that and I'm already making ads specific to that niche anyways. But it'd be nice um, to go outside of a niche and, and, and say, okay, where is the data telling us for this specific ad? Maybe it's fishing. I have no idea what people, you know, who fish, what brands they like or what <laughs> categories they're in. Maybe they're readers. Maybe, maybe they like Porsches, Porsches or something. I don't know, you know, so. You want to, are, are, you, are you, okay, so are you asking if there's a way to correlate the types of, like, people who like different genres? Yes. Uh, yeah, there's totally a way to do that. Um, let me think. Off the top of my head, I would say probably use canonical correlation analysis. This is literally the, this is such an amazing tool. I love this. I will preach this all day long. I will evangelize this all day long. You can literally use this to do anything you want. You can extract out, like, all of the things that people in one niche like and then extract out all of the things that, that people in another niche like and then like compare them. Okay, so can we pull the API from social medias in general and and use that demographic and have that data pool? Can you do that? Is yes. there a way of doing that with like, as an example, Instagram? Can we pull like a ton of Instagram accounts that are specific to hashtag niches or? or... Oh yeah, you totally could. So like, like going back to the woman, like let's pull, you know, a demographic of women in America that like The Bachelor and then see what, uh, what are the other top things that they like that's with The Bachelor. And then from there we can speculate, okay, maybe they don't like Supreme as much as they like, I don't know, you know, Chanel or something like that, right? Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah, I can tell you that. All right. Well, let me know if you're interested in that. <laughs> okay. Um... I am currently not, uh, I, I, okay, so currently, let me, so currently what I'm doing in terms of data analysis is I'm creating a market trend prediction um, tool, which essentially takes three different uh, axes. One is the individual user, the other is a specific question, and then the last one is a multiple choice answer to that question. And predicting exactly, in, you know, just predicting what these users like uh, across time and like correlating how they answer different questions um, across time. Uh, so I'm my my area of interest is is more along uh, regression. But I, I do use CCA all the time for this. So okay, yeah. Any other questions? So how do you reach the people that are more difficult to reach? Maybe ones that don't use hashtags. Um, or that don't fit into the I watch Friends every week, even though I have every episode. And oh, I love that's, you. that's a good one. Like, how do you how do you reach those people? Um, because they still there's still a market for those as well. Um, yes. But how does that work? How do I how do I reach them? Yeah, like um, like what do you do like as far as data gathering and just all of it, you know, like I don't know people that sit around and read books. <laughs> like, how do you get to them? How do you how do you get any data from them? How do you get how do you do anything with them? Well, I'm not going to say that this is like the right way that you should do it, but you could <laughs> get data from these people by, you know, let's say okay, people buy things. Everybody buys things, right? Right. So that's why I'm saying it's like, it's very easy to, to say like the bachelor, bachelorette people, you know, cause that's like a huge, that's like the, the Facebook moms, like you, you know exactly how to find all the channels right. to be find how to market to them and it's very easy to market to them sometimes yes. sometimes not trying to downplay <laughs> them not like oh yeah i know everything but but when it's someone that's really complex if you can master them then then realistically then you can master anyone right um okay so i don't know about mastering people and what that really means well, i don't um... mean it in a narcissistic way i swear <laughs> i did not mean it like that i'm just like like if you but i mean mastering in anything right like isn't that kind of what's important if you are able to um, be proficient in something. And if you're proficient in the most difficult thing, then you are going to be proficient, obviously, in anything less than that, right? Um, Have it? I, I, I guess that makes sense. Um, let me, let me, let me like try to like interpret your question in a way that like makes sense and like say it back to you and you tell me if this is the actual question. Okay. So basically, um, what you're, what you're, I think, I think what you're asking is, Let's say that there's people who are not very much on social media, who don't put out a lot of data on the internet. How do we get the data for these people and then market to them? Yes, that's definitely one part of it. Yes. Okay, so let me start with that, and then you can you can add on after. 
Um, so I would say that let's, it, it depends on what you're trying to do. Like once, once we go, you know, are you trying to create a customer profile? Are you trying to predict a market trend or are you trying to optimize your product? So if you're trying to create a customer profile for these kinds of people, um, what I would say is if they already buy from you, then you can just start creating profiles. If you want them to buy from you, but they don't buy from you and you know what you're looking for, for example, people who read lots of books, what you can do is you can go and look for people who buy books on Amazon. You can look for, you can see, I don't know if you're allowed to do this. I don't know if this is uh, ethical, but you can might be able to get books, the, the list of people that buy books from Barnes and Nobles or Borders or whatever. Um, and you can basically get that data. You can see, okay, um, this user bought, you know, these 12 books in the last, you know, two months. Uh, what else do they like? And you check their Amazon purchase history. I, once again, I don't know if this is ethical, but, you know, you check their Amazon purchase history and it's like, okay, this person also likes um, fancy shoes and I sell fancy shoes. Then you can, you know, kind of like target them based on the books they have. Like, okay, like, you know, they're, all of their books are about, um, what's the genre of books? I don't know, mystery then we will create an ad with fancy shoes that appeals to mystery readers. You know, I, I don't, I, I'm not, I'm not actually an expert on ads. So like, I, I don't know what kind of ad you'd create there, but something like that. Um, let's say you're trying to predict market trends. Uh, then you would, then this is like a more broad topic. You could go, you could go and grab like uh, all of the data on the books that are being bought. You could be like, okay, you know, uh, these guys are, um, let's say like one, like one book genre that's getting super popular recently could be like, oh, you know, mystery books are getting super popular. You know, there's 300,000 sales last in Q1 of 2020, 400,000 sales in Q2, you know, 520,000 in Q3. And then, oh my God, 750,000 sales in Q4. We got to sell, we got to start selling mystery books. Um, Product trend or op efficiency or optimization. This one you can pretty much only do from the people who are, who like buy from you. Uh, you know that's uh, you can't really. Get, it's it's hard to get like customer like data of what people would want to buy from you without them actually having bought from you. So basically, what you're saying then is the customer profiles are kind of paramount to everything else. They're the amino acids of this whole thing. Uh, yeah, yeah. Customer profiles are. I mean, this is this is exactly how you do like uh, marketing and advertising, right? You specifically want to target like, like you know, you know, whatever uh, college students who love coffee and stay up to two a.m. and you know, whatever read books. You want to create like a customer profile before you can really do anything. Okay, so um, question then, going off that example, can can you with AI theoretically pull, let's say, college students, right, from sure. colleges, can you uh, pull all the images that they posted on Facebook and use the AI to uh, verify that they have either, one, a beer in their hand, two, uh, a red cup, or some type of drinking game or anything like that? So that we we can have that data pool. Uh, yeah, you could you could you could totally do that. Um, I don't know how I don't know how legal that is. Background. Yeah, I'm not. Yeah, I, I don't know how like legal or ethical that is. But yes, you, you you could do that. Well, so to your other your other point about the Barnes and Noble thing, um, you could just pull people's Amazon wish lists. Yeah, that, you could pull people's Amazon people. wish lists too. That's that's public information. Most people choose to publicly show their Amazon wish list as if it's a trophy. <laughs> oh, cool. I, I, so I that's something. Oh, yeah. That's actually been a big thing for um, when when uh, the government is uh, looking for terrorists. They look at people's Amazon wish list. Oh, for real? Yeah. Wait, wait, how does Amazon wish list correlate with terrorism? I will, I'll have to find you some stuff. I'll have to <laughs> I'm gonna get some going but yeah that's they actually it. can uh, pull the the purchase history from amazon they they amazon has to uh legally right. hand that over to them that's that's a bit different though i'm talking more about what what he'd be able to do oh yeah yeah, yeah probably, i mean probably can't i'm not the government for, that, you know. for data so, mining <laughs> yeah. yeah okay uh any other questions or did you want to build upon your question ocean 
No, I mean, I feel like that that answered it adequately. I was just trying to understand because um, I um, came in a little bit late, so oh, I just was okay. But now, now I get it, so it all makes sense. Okay. Oh, cool. Okay, yeah. Um, any other questions, guys? No, I just I need a data set with like everybody who drinks a certain brand of beer, so I could <laughs> sell it to the competitor. <laughs> I'd be like, advertise to these guys, man. They're they're drinking your. Uh... Does he now? <laughs> yeah, I actually just downloaded both of those books. Dude, those are uh, huge books. They are huge books, yeah. They're like textbook size in real life, by the way. Uh, if anyone wants, they are in the tools section. You can get them there. That one is about 15 pages. Oh, okay, that's that's actually more like reasonable. <laughs> yeah, mine are actually unreasonably long. By most yeah, like, I, I got the, what was it? Um, master Yourself, Master Yourself, whatever. I, I, yeah, you posted yourself. those in... Yeah, you posted those in, in Synergy, and so I like downloaded both of them. I just took a look, and I was like, oh, this one's like 234 pages. And I was like, the other one's five times the size. And it was like, oh, this one's 500 and something pages. I was like, what the heck, man? <laughs> I was like, look, yeah, man, I've wanted to write a book for a long time, but like, oh, my God, you've written two huge books. So, so technically, <laughs> technically, I'm also in a couple other books that I have some, some work in as well. Oh, wow. That's pretty awesome. Thank you. Uh, so I was going to say something facetious, but now it's inappropriate, but how big is big data? How big is big data? That's actually a very good question. <clears throat> so safe. All right. <laughs> uh, big data has different sizes depending on who you talk to. I generally say if you've got, if you've got a data set, that's like bigger than like, uh, bigger than like a hundred megabytes, like that it's close enough to big data, but then you can talk to people who are like big data isn't, uh, it's not big until you have, you know, 15 gigabytes of data. I'm like, that's a fuck ton of data. That's where is uh, where does where does medium data fall along these lines? Medium data, um, yeah. Medium data sets are like you know like somewhere between like I don't know five to ten megabytes. What would Not... that look like in practice? Uh, you know your your 500 page book. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that one's like 10 megabytes. Damn. All right. Yeah, big so data. Is, that's, yeah. that's a medium data book then. Good. Yeah, 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 yeah. If that. I were to run like text analysis on that book, it would be like medium data size. It wouldn't be like terribly. It wouldn't like take terribly long to train. And it wouldn't take terribly long to run. Um, so you know, it, it wouldn't like I wouldn't have to go. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I wouldn't have to go like buy server space to go run this. Is like basically my like. That's basically like at the point where I feel like I would have to go buy server space to go run a certain like data set that's when i'm like okay this is big data right okay yeah so uh so the largest annual data created i believe last year was uh video surveillance data so like your zoom recordings all that stuff mm. cctvs etc and it's like, like 38 38 zettabytes is what they said was created last year that's huge yeah that's a lot i don't even know what zeta means like that's i've never even heard that word before <laughs> I've heard terabytes, I've heard picobytes, and I assume Zeta is above that, so. Anyone got the numbers for it? Sam, you got the Probably numbers? 15 zeros, 18 I'll, zeros. I'll, I'll, I'll post the, um, the picture I have in the tech chat one sec. Okay. Cool. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks for hosting this, Sam. Yeah, it was fun. 